Whether you're a hardcore off-roader, a weekend warrior, overland camper, or maybe you're a stock vehicle and your off-road experience doesn't go much further than the mall, adding a set of rock lights or ground lighting to your vehicle can be one of the simplest but most beneficial lighting accessory you can add to nearly any vehicle. Sure, we've seen the trucks going down the highway with all different kind of color lights in the wheel wells, and that's cool and flashy, but there is a purpose to these rock lights or ground lights. In a mall crawler application, you could be a stock vehicle, and you can actually have this wired in to your courtesy lamps. That way, anytime you unlock your vehicle or open the door, you actually flood the area with light with where you're standing or what you're coming up to. It adds a sense of security to your vehicle. Example would be a dark parking lot. You're opening up your vehicle or you're actually unlocking your vehicle from a distance. You actually emit light. Not only is it safer for you, but you make yourself actually more visible. Moving on to say a camping application. If you have the lights emitting down, it keeps it out of everybody's eyes. It's not intrusive to your camp area but it does add a sense of safety and knowing that there are things that are on the ground that can actually hurt you, you can have a sense of comfort knowing that there is nothing hiding up under your vehicle. Moving on to the off-road applications, not just for negotiating over rocks for your spotter, have an easier way of seeing, but should you have a situation where you break something on the trail, you now have a fixed lighting. You can remove your wheels or any of your components, fix whatever you have, your lighting's there. Sure, you can use headlights or anything like that to have more direct lighting, but you can see what's going on, get you set up, and get you back on the trail. So ultimately, you're adding a safety feature to your vehicle. Want to see what we chose to go with? Stay tuned. Hey, hey welcome back to the Gator Overland Channel. I'm John. And in today's video, we'll be installing these Lux Lighting System rock lights to the bottom side of our Jeep Gladiator. Now, why I chose to go with the Lux Lights? Well, nearly every off-road manufacturer in the game offers a set of off-road or similar rock lights to go on the bottom end. A lot of them are actually just the same lights, rebranded, put in a different box, and more often than not, they are an economical buy that come from another country outside of the United States and can lead to problems with quality control. Lux lights are 100% made in the United States and sourced with as much USA branded products on the inside. So you know you're going to get a great product all the way down to the rubber band that holds this stuff together. But that's not the main point here. Where they really raise the bar, not only are they one of the brightest and strongest, but it is the simplest installation that you can do. It's literally plug and play. They offer little box controllers that work with your auxiliary group if you have that. If not, you can work it with switches as well. But the best part about it, it's a no drill application. You can put it anywhere on the vehicle as long as it is metal because these things are magnetized. And I know what you're thinking, a little simple magnet, it's just gonna flop off. Well, these are special neodymium magnets that are way more strong than the actual light itself would require to hang on. And I mean, watch your fingers because they pinch real quick, but that's a guarantee. We will test this to see how strong they are. But basically, simple as it can be, Wiring can be difficult sometimes. You remove the difficulty out of it. It's plug and play, and it's made in the United States. It does run a little bit on the high end, but in the idea that you're in an off-road application, you go with the concept of buy once, cry once, and here you go. It's the Lux Lights. Let's get it installed. Before we get started, I wanted to preface that I am not affiliated with Lux Lighting Systems, nor is this a sponsored video. This is just me doing research, investing in a product, installing it, and paying it forward to you guys in the process. If you've seen any of my previous videos, you understand that they are full of information and tend to run on the long side. So for your viewing convenience, this video is timestamped, allowing you to go to any point in the video without actually having to scroll or watch all the way through. Don't forget to check the description below as I'll have links to the Lux lights as well as tools to help install the lights and any contact information via email or social media should you have any questions about my build or the installation today. So what do you get? As we are a truck application, it's ideal to opt for at least a length set of 20, but smaller SUVs and car applications can probably get away with 10. You can pre-measure to get the ideal. 20 is always gonna be the safe measure. There's not much difference in price between the two. In the kit, you'll get your set of lights here and some zip ties. As you can see and mentioned before, we have a thermoplastic layer here that's good from negative 40 all the way up to 105 degrees Celsius. We have our neodymium magnets here. There's a set of four. They are triple coated, nickel for strength, copper for heat dissipation, 
and then the epoxy. And that allows you to go directly there. It's 100% waterproof sealed. And with the shape that you have there, it allows the orb light to expand out. Now, as far as the lighting, it's 150 milliamps. So times eight is going to be at about 1200 milliamps, which is actually 1.2 amps. So these are very, very low draw. And the advantage of being so bright, they actually dissipate heat through the magnets into the metal that they attach to. Not only is the epoxy resin that this is made out of, but the insulation here is also impervious to oil, fuel, and UV. So you don't have to worry about these breaking down anytime soon. And as simple as it gets, you just connect it to metal and it's got quite a bit of resistance uh, to come off there, super strong. Now you can opt for the controller box. I have an auxiliary group pre-wired in my truck, came from the factory, and this allows you to wire in 12 sets of lights. You can double up in some cases if you need to go more than that and they have resettable fuses. So if there ends up being a short, it will actually opt out until the short is fixed and then fix itself. But literally it is simple as taking your end wires that are pre-cut for you and put the negative into the negative side and the positive into the positive side. It has got three zones that you can run on separate switches if you want. I've already got one zone three already wired and just out of the way. I only plan on doing the two zones for eight wiring. You twist this together right here into a butt connector and you connect it to your auxiliary group wire and you push the button. It is that simple. Otherwise, if you want to keep it simple, this is a, a little bit more costly adder for the application. You can do butt connectors, but keep in mind you have eight main wires with two wires in each. That is 16. So you'll have to twist butt connectors and consolidate down until you get to one. So basically eight to one. This is just basically going to make things that much easier. So let's go over some tools we might need to install this. All right, just a brief overview of what you see here is definitely what it will take to get the job done. You may have some tools of your own to make the project go even easier. We have our universal screwdriver here. We have our terminal crimper with end cutters. I went ahead and put out some uh, needle nose pliers, a wire stripper. You can also use a utility knife. Electrical tape will be needed. You have heat shrink there if you want to opt for it. For good measure, you got a measuring tape. Probably won't need it, but it's good to have anyway. You want to have a marking utensil. Anything, you know, marker, pen. That way you can pretty much mark where the lights are going to go and you'll always remember where they were. Moving on to the wiring portion of it, I'm going to use this little deer feeder battery. It's a 12 volt battery that will allow me to run all the wires to this prior to wiring everything and I can get all my lights affixed and figure out the lighting on the ground rather than running all the lights and figuring out maybe I should have moved one down. So this will be a little bit more of a step, but in the long run, it's going to make things easier. So definitely nice to have these for any of your electrical projects anyway. If you're going to be doing the simple lighting, you want to have some type of rocker switches, whether it's a, a single dual pole, triple pole setup like this, maybe have some additional zip ties. All your terminal connectors, your actual lights themselves, they're going to be on the whites only is a 20 AWG and for the red, green, blue, whites or RBGW, I think is what it is. They're an 22 AWG. I usually run 16 gauge on pretty much everything on the vehicle, but it's a little bit overkill for the, the amp draw of this, which is very minimal. So when it comes to your connectors, definitely look at what size you're going to be dealing with. You could double things over and put them in here, but you'll probably want to look for the ones that are the red insulated plastic on the outside. And we have our butt connectors, spade connectors if you want di quick disconnect, and ring terminal connectors if you want to go to any grounds or battery sources. Now I did mention earlier that you could run these lights off of a courtesy group. Well, you'll need something called a diode. And basically a diode is one-way traffic line and it doesn't allow it to go both ways. So in the idea that you have your rock light connected on the output here, you can have your power source from your auxiliary group coming into this one and you can tap into your courtesy lamps and have it connected to this one. That allows you to turn on the switch on the dash and turn on the lights or when you open up the door, it will turn on the lights. But when you turn on the dash lights, it will not allow power to go on and turn on your courtesy lights. You wouldn't want that every time you turn on your rock lights for every other light to come on too. So it's a nice little inexpensive smart way. This is up to three amps, so more than perfect for this. I might not do this particular option, but it is always available to do. And definitely if you're running anything off your battery, put in a inline fuse. That way you have your first source of contact 
you always put this as close as possible to the actual battery source itself. So if it was nearer to the battery, you put this here and then you'll go to any of your switch parts after that, more or less like this if you wanted to. And now it's time to get started. We're gonna start out with the 20 foot length starting from the back and working our way forward. We're gonna bring everything over to this little battery and we're gonna use a set of gator clips to just kind of pull everything together. Now on the inside of the actual leaflet that allows it to hang, there is some instructions basically telling you to go ahead and clean any obstructions, dirt or grime that could be anywhere that you're trying to affix your magnets to make sure that it has a good clean contact and a little bit of wiring how to, but it's so simple that Pretty much anybody can do this, but it is nice to have the detailed nomenclature here. All right, now to the easy part. As you can see, I have things pre-laid out. I got 420s out back, 410s up front. I did have to improvise up here on the front end. You'll find that a lot of vehicles and more modern vehicles these days either have a plastic shroud, fabric shroud, or the internal components of the fenders are made of aluminum. In our case, we had a plastic shroud. So what I did, I found a high carbon steel hacksaw blade, stuck it in a vise, bent it back and forth a few times, and boom snap perfect length highly magnetized carbon steel and I affixed it to an existing bolt on the inside of the fender well. It's going to make for a perfect application for this light. Be able to feed it through the plastic and everything is good. So you may have some instances that you have to overcome and adapt but other than that it's going to be simple. Let's get these stuck on. That's it, just repeat it on the other side. Can't be more simple. Being as this was a daytime activity to find things out that is gonna be used at night, we had to synthesize darkness. So we had the garage closed and I covered all the windows on the front of the garage. Let's black this thing out, see how these things work. Let there be light. All right, we got our lights going exactly where we need. As you can see, we have plenty of visibility in there if we need to change any parts on the trail. We have light down here, looking at it from the frame side. We have them positioned all the way down. And then going towards the back, we have them just up here, which gives a pretty good amount of area all the way back to the bumper and tailgate area. So that should be good for us. Before we fish all the wires up here into the engine bay, we need to figure out our actual power source. Now, some of y'all are gonna opt for the less expensive option, not using the controller, and just using an actual switch. So the switch, the way it will be operated, you have your ground here at the top, you have your power in, which will be coming from the battery, and power out to your actual rock lights. Now, being that you have eight individual rock lights, some of you will be 12 or even more, you will take all those eight wires, you will take all the red, twist them all together into one final wire, and that will go on the output here. So basically, you're gonna have to Christmas tree them all down using butt connectors. As small as the wire is, you could probably get four into one connector, and then from there go to two, and then two into one, and that one will connect to that middle pole. This will just go to any ground location underneath the dash. Any source of non-painted metallic source will be a great ground if you want it to light up. This will still operate without grounding it, it just won't light up the switch. Now, if you want to make it even easier on yourself and you have the auxiliary group, you can opt for this. You just need to find a location for this to go. I've selected right here. This might not be the best for some, but they do come with an actual setup of double-sided tape for you to stick on everything. I live in Southeast Texas. It's super muggy. This stuff does not hold up. So I'm going to utilize the self-tapping screws and the screws that are black in here are what hold on this lid. So what I did, I double checked underneath my lid here, found a safe spot to utilize for the holes that are provided in the flange, and there's nothing here, and where it contacts, it's an open void, and they didn't go far enough down to actually have anything. So yes, I am screwing into the cap there, but it won't be an issue. The reason why I'm going there is because we have our main ground. It's gonna go right here, where all the source grounds are on the fender well. And then these, if you have the auxiliary group, 
You're gonna pull out your loom right here. As you can see, I already have some lights going towards the rear. You have 240 amps and 215. We are gonna connect these to one butt connector and connect it like that. This will allow us to have the ground and our power nice, tidy, neat. All the wires are gonna fish up through here, go into the unit, and now you're wondering, well, what if you have to change fuses? This will be connected here. This box can come forward and will actually have slack to access anything and I can still see my fuse panel box here. So that's what we're gonna go with right now. I'm gonna use the set screws and we'll be good to go. Now we're connected, we can come off and it will go just that way. All the wires are gonna come through and up into there just like that. Now that we have all of our wiring routed to the engine bay, comes the easy part, trimming it and plugging it in. It's that simple. As you can see, choosing to go with 10 foot and 20 foot came out with plenty of excess, but definitely go with 20 foot if you have a truck. I have one wire that came out just long enough to not be short, but it's gonna work out in this situation. This is everything that came from the passenger side, and this is everything from the driver's side and then up over the firewall. So let's get started. Wiring to the aux controller. As you can see, we have three zones here. You can set it up to where each zone is on its own switch, setting off different lights at different times. And the idea, we want to have eight wires going to eight lights, and we are gonna combine zones one and two so they come on at the same time. As you can see, I have zone three just wired and laid back for either future use or I don't intend to at all. But this is where paying a little bit extra makes things super easy. Pull it in right here. There's eight individual holes here. If you have more that you're splicing together to go to 12, just combine them before actually coming in and send in the one wire. As you can see here, we have our negative lines and our positive lines. It is as easy as sliding this in and tightening down. And it is literally that easy. Just trim to the length that you need, put it down here, out of the way, and then all you have to do from here is connect your ground and these to your auxiliary group. So the underhood wiring portion of this is gonna be specific to the Jeep Gladiator and JL Wrangler, but it will be very similar for most others. As you can see, I have the split loom run from the driver's side over through and terminating into zone two. And the same, I have the passenger side run up and around, tandeming in right there and terminating into zone one. Look how nice and neat everything is. As mentioned before, it's got resettable fuses, so if you end up having a short, it will reset after you correct that. Now you have your negative that's gonna go to your ground, and you have your two zones that are gonna go to a source of power. For those of you running to a regular switch, that's what you will connect to your power. If you're gonna run an auxiliary group, six shooter or anything like that, here we have our 15 amp auxiliary button three. Those are gonna connect right there. That's that, we're ready to plug this stuff up. Now that we have all of our lights wired to our control box, all we gotta do is connect our negative to a ground and our positive to a source of power. What I like to do is take the blue insulator, whatever color insulator off. It doesn't allow sometimes for a proper connection. And then I like to put on a little bit of heat shrink. Just makes things nice and clean. Now when you're using a set of crimpers like this, you'll notice that there is a split in the actual barrel. You wanna use the side away from the pinch point. So see this, this would be wrong. There's a split. You wanna put the split in the curve point and the pinch point on the back. We have our heat shrink already on there. And then you just squeeze. Back it off, do a double take. And now you can see you have a proper done with the wire. Slide that bad boy up there like that. Yeah, look at you, you're a pro. We're gonna connect that bad boy right there. I could do this without dropping the nut. We have our ground established. 
we can run our wire down and out of the way just like that. And our positive, I'm going to go ahead, snip that right there, give ourselves a good little piece there, twist it up. These ends are already prepped. Now do keep in mind, you can use a butt connector here to connect these two together, or you can use spade connections. I like to use spade connections on things like this in case I need to actually get to them. I can disconnect them. I'm still going to use a shrink wrap over the top of them so it will be completely sealed. But for now, we're gonna twist these two together like this. Don't forget your heat shrink. Slide that bad boy down over the top of there. And remember in this case, we have our pinch pinch. There's the split, so we'll flip it around this way. Hug in on the back side of that. Squeeze down. Give a nice little flat spot there. You can see we have a great positive connection there. Now what we're gonna do here, the barrel first. See it up in there. Do that. Finish the print there. Now we can connect the two like so. And without the insulation on there, you slide this down. It covers both of them. Make sure you are clear on both sides. Like it like that. Hit the ends. Now you have yourself a good waterproof connection. If you should ever actually need to disconnect that, you just score down the line and pull it apart. It's a good fail safe method. Now for the time being, I'm just gonna tuck that down just like that. Now it's time to give yourself a pat on the back because you just wired your own rock lights. Last step here, put in the lid on top, getting your screws ready to go. I do keep in mind these are a type of self tapper screw. So you might want to Do one back turn first to get it set, and then it kind of just makes its own way there. While we're waiting on the sun to go down so we can see these lights at night in the wild, I figured right now would be a great opportunity to show you exactly how strong these magnets are. Now I know many of y'all will probably be going through either automatic car washes or manually washing your vehicle with a pressure washer and you're curious to what these magnets can withstand. Now do keep in mind that the actual tensile strength of these bulbs themselves are up to 4,000 pounds and the actual compression strength of these particular light bulbs is over 7,000 pounds, literally almost twice as much as this vehicle, not twice, but close. So you can actually smash these pretty good, but how strong are they gonna be up against the vehicle as far as pressure goes? Well, we're gonna test it with a 3100 PSI pressure washer here, and I'm gonna have a 2500 PSI nozzle on the inside and put it to the test. Let's check it out. Well, the proof's in the pudding. Those lights hold up to at least 2,500 PSI worth of water pressure, not even budging. I'm very happy with that. Anybody who's concerned about water pressure going to automatic car washes, this one's in the bag, good to go. Let's go check out these lights at night. Here we are pulling into camp at dusk. It's really the darkest, hardest to see time. There you go. Safe feet or great feet? Oh yeah, check that out. That is awesome. Full 360 all the way around with good frontal area, all the way around to the back. I would say off to the side of the Jeep, it's at least three foot of ambience, solid ambience. I'm at about four feet here 
and I'm just out of what it can be, but I can see from where the, the fender light is, it cascades out here. So that'll be great for camp, great for really anything. Being at the beach, that's an awesome amount of light. The great part is it's low amp draw. You can run those for probably hours at saying the least. So that is awesome. Well, that about wraps things up. If you enjoyed today's video, found it informative or helpful in making your decision to go with the Lux Lighting System Rock Lights for your vehicle, give us a big thumbs up. Let us know how we're doing. Share if you'd like. I'd appreciate that. For a heads up on any future installs or adventures, go ahead and hit that subscribe button, notification bell. And you can follow us along our journey. Don't forget to check the description below for links to the website for the lights as well as tools and contact information should you have any questions. Remember, we at Gator Overland encourage each and every one of you to take a daily moment to unplug and reconnect with the outdoors, even if it's just for a few minutes. Have fun, keep it safe, and just go. Thanks, y'all.